Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Spellman. I'm the head of thought leadership at the World Economic Forum, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, topic around uh, human-centric uh, digital identities. Uh, and I'm joined by two World Economic Forum colleagues, uh, Christian Duda on my left, who is going to be uh, our online moderator, moderator and looking at some of the comments that we're going to get online, and uh, Monica Gowacki, who's uh, our rapporteur for today. So thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us. Um, if you think about why you've been here this week, I think a lot of us have been motivated by how do we shape a inclusive, sustainable, 
and trustworthy digital future. And those words about inclusivity, about sustainability, and about trustworthy are right at the heart of what digital identity is all about. And so if we look at this discussion today and think that by 2024, there may be 5 billion people who are in some way using digital identity systems. But if you look at some of the challenges that we've got, a lot of the issues that we've talked about this week are right at the center of the digital identity debate. It's about ambition, but how do you balance that with capability? It's about how do we get inclusion, but avoid exclusion? How do you empower people with digital identity, but yet avoid discrimination? And if we look at some of the aspects of today's world and what is coming round the corner, we can see how digital identity becomes absolutely central to everything that's involved in participating in the digital economy. If we think about cross-border travel, think about the possibility of doing remote operations on your heart where the doctor is operating from another country. Think about the role of government e-services going forward. The possibility of using data from multiple agencies around humanitarian aid. All of these will involve aspects of digital identity as we look forward. But the question that we've got to ask is, are we falling into some of the same old traps? The issues about single-use identities when we know that what users want is an approach that's inclusive, involves their ability, not just in terms of health, not just in terms of banking, not just in terms of travel, not just in terms of how they interact with government services, but they're looking for something which is user-centric. So it's not just about how do we create digital identity systems, but it's about how do we make sure that those systems truly create value for the user. So those are some of the issues that I hope we can begin to get into today as we talk about human-centric uh, digital uh, identity. And the format for today is that um, I'm delighted, I'll introduce the panelists uh, to you in a second. We're going to have a, a panel discussion uh, to frame some of the issues, get the debate uh, moving. And then uh, we're going to get you to work. Uh, so we're going to have some breakouts, and we're going to have half an hour in breakouts, and then uh, in those breakouts there's five groups, and you get 15 minutes in one of the groups, and then a second 15 minutes uh, at, the at a second group of your choice. And I hope that what we'll be able to do is draw on some of the collective wisdom in the room. And particularly what we're interested in is your insights, but also where you see good examples. So what are the examples that we can draw on as we go forward over the course of the next uh, three, four, uh, five years? That's the sort of the time frame. And I hope that by the end of this 90 minutes together, that what we'll be able to think a little bit more about is what are some of the principles that we need to understand better to help us with user-centric digital identities? What are some of the use cases? What are some of the best practices that will help shape how we should be implementing digital identity going forward? What are some of the main policy considerations that we should be looking at? How do we avoid some of those pitfalls that we can already see? And then finally, what do we think, and what does particularly the panel think, are some of the next steps that will enable us to move forward in a way that helps us to address both digital identity through a public lens, through a private lens, through an individual perspective, a business perspective, and a governmental lens. So I hope that that frames the discussion for us a little bit. And what I'd like to do is go to the uh, panel. So starting with uh, uh, Linda Bonio on my right. Uh, Linda is the chief executive of Lawyer Hub. And so we'll come to Linda in a second. Uh, on her uh, right is uh, Dirk uh, Warwood of Verimi. And uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, 
Dirk, what you've got to say about how you're going to revol revolutionise digital identity. Uh, then we have Sebastian um, Hufnagel from Dell, and then Michael uh, Bultmann from Here Technologies. So uh, you've got pictures up there at the, uh, uh, on the screen. So Linda, let me start with, uh, with you, uh, Lawyers Hub, and one of the things that you've been looking at is this whole question of how the legal system and justice works with technology. And I know that one of the uh, exercises you ran recently was a hackathon in Kenya, looking at the whole question about digital identity. So just help us a little bit to explain what you've been doing and what are some of the insights that you want to sort of share with us about what you're finding around digital identity? Because I think one of the things that we're very aware of in these discussions is we can't look at it all through a developed country lens, and we need to think about it through uh, the lens of different parts of the world. Thank you very much. Um, I'd want to just say a little bit about what the Lawyers Hub does. We realized the gap between law and technology. And um, the usual lawmaking process is very bureaucratic and does not involve a lot of you know, the, the, the communities in our, in our country. So I'm from Kenya, and we work across Africa. So the Lawyers Hub trains lawyers to understand technology so that they make better policies. In our analysis, most of the time, the regulators and policymakers are actually lawyers. Members of parliament in Africa mostly will compose of lawyers. And so we thought that was a good place to start from. And now we um, host weekly events to talk about policy. And we have about 150 lawyers who come into our space every week. We have 1,000 active membership. And we have a mailing list of 10,000 lawyers. And so our, our reach has been very deliberate. And we see the difference in engaging lawyers in policymaking processes. So on digital identity, uh, I think it's important to learn the history before we move on digital platforms. And so in Kenya, for instance, we had um, the whole colonial uh, registration identity system that began, began in the 1920s. And so that sort of classified everybody in terms of their tribe and where they come from. So if I look at your, uh, your ID card, identity card in Kenya, or even Uganda, no, not Uganda, but mostly Kenya, Zimbabwe, I would be able to indicate exactly where you come from, what your tribe is, just from your identity card. And so when the government put in place and said they're coming up with a, um, a Kuduma number, which is their version of digital identity, we thought that it was actually not well thought through because one, uh, we have stateless individuals in Kenya. We have individuals who are actually stateless and moving them to a digital identity without sorting out issues um, of exclusion would actually exclude them further in a digital environment. And so uh, we also asked about the second question, how do we ensure that there is privacy around, this, um, around these issues. The Kenyan government have, have been hacked more times than I have been hacked. And so having this information in their databases and their proposal was to centralize digital identity. And centralizing it on the layer of also adding DNA information on the digital identity would be problematic in the case that what if this information is compromised? And at that particular point, Kenya did not have a Data Protection Act. We recently enacted a Data Protection Act, I think two weeks ago, and just came into place on 25th November, that's on Monday. And so without a Data Protection Act, we thought that that would actually not work. So what did we do? We got on the ground and started doing policy hackathons and inviting people to our spaces and saying, what do you think about digital identity? Do you understand it? What, what proposals do you have? And what can we do about it? So we did um, policy hackathon across the country and developed an alternative policy, which we hope that African countries can take it up as alternative and model law. Because we think what's, what's missing, especially in the global south, is who can we learn, learn from? Most of the African countries are looking at India, for example, and saying, you already have the Adhar system. Can we pick your law for what it is? But our jurisdictions are different. We need something that's more African, that actually understands the difference in population. The tribe, for instance, um, I don't think a tribe, tribe information needs to go on an identity card. That means we are simply taking issues that we have fought through the years to a digital platform. So um, my final comment on, on this would be, um, learning from Kenya, I think digital identity should take fast, um, should have meaningful consent. The government should not force you into 
a digital platform, but ensure that users actually opt in um, willfully, they see value in it, they see why they need to come into that system, um, and also engage other sector players, engage the lawyers, engage businesses, because businesses understand the importance of having a digital identity. And people also understand why uh, it's important for them to be authenticated, that you know, it could offer me good, good, you know, good, um, good alternatives if I'm banking, if I'm walking into a building, and I wanna surprise you, in Kenya, there are buildings you can't access without an identity card. And so people who are stateless and even refugees who haven't been recognized cannot access certain buildings in Kenya. And so I think identity is crucial for an economy such as ours and also across the continent. And learning from Ethiopia, my last point is this, learning from Ethiopia, they took a different approach and said, can we test a particular population around digital ID, then scale it to across the country? Thank you. So Linda, just, can, you, can I just pick up on this question about do Kenyans truly see value in this digital identity? So my understanding is 38 million people have signed up to this digital identity program. But the real question is whether it's Kenya or any other country, is ultimately do people see value in it and the issues of friction? So when you did the hackathon, what was the value that your individual saw? I, I understand the problems about tribes and uh, ethnicity, but where's the source of value? Because if we can't get the value clear, I think the digital identity programs won't fly. I think the value uh, is seen mostly by businesses. Um, we had a discussion last week on, um, on digital identity and KYC. And a lot of the businesses that are already working on um, building products around digital ID see the value, the banks see the value, but individual users still do not see the value. Um, the government had, um, they had a tagline that if you get Huduma number, then you will have better government services. And so I see tweets, people just, you know, uh, humor on Twitter, and they're saying, yeah, it's 100 days since I registered for Duma number, but I still don't get government services. So they don't see the value. Um, I think it will take a lot of teaching, and then also organizations like private sector having actual products on digital identity that actually would, you know, be interoperable with what government is already doing for people to see the value in, in ID. Super, thanks very much. Michael, let me, let me come to you, a very uh, different context, which is mapping and location services, um, but huge uh, geographical implications as those get rolled out. So how does digital identity in your business lens work? Yeah, first of all, um, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks a lot for having us here. I have to first give my compliments to the selection of the topic. And that was the reason why I was immediately saying to my colleagues, well, this is spot on. It is a, a topic of high relevance to all of us, human-centric digital identities. In one word, what we are doing, and Mark was already alluding to it, we are collecting, well, we are capturing the entire world in digital format. So we are active in 200 countries of the world and have a digital representation of the world, if possible in real time. This is not always possible in some parts of the world, uh, but we are on a good way. Um, we learned over the years the relevance and importance of digital identities. I mean, the starting point, we are not a clearly consumer brand, but um, more a, a customer uh, brand, so business to business uh, and business to business to consumer uh, approach. However, we realize that it is quite crucial um, to have, a, well, a proper management and a proper view on identities. I can give you an example. I was sitting in a, in a board meeting in California and my, a colleague from China was saying, I don't know what you have about privacy. It's always about GDPR and consent and the relation between individuals and the government. We have a massive issue in China because there is not only one Mark Spellman running around in China, there are at least 20. So the identity is taken away. And without a proper identity and being really sure that the person who is allegedly acting is really the one who would like to vote, to consume, to express an opinion, is the real one behind, we have an issue. I'm, of course, not the one who is kind of giving advice to governments how to do. I have a bit of a simple-minded business view on it. But we see huge opportunity and necessity to focus much more on that. To give you one example, in the area of banking, we are collaborating with, with a big credit card company, it's not a secret, with MasterCard, um, and they have really the need to understand that the person who is allegedly behind a transaction is the one 
uh, who is claiming to be that person buying now a concretely a watch in Geneva. Looking again to you, Mark, sorry. So that is of crucial importance, and location intelligence is playing a bit of a role in it to double check whether this information is correct. So digital identities are of uh, outstanding importance there. We are as well contributing to Rami, I'll leave it to my colleague Dirk in, in a moment to, to describe that approach, but my, my main message clearly is here, um, before we are talking about the challenges, about discrimination, about equal access to it, what is crucial in, in, the, in, in the internet without any doubt, um, we need to, to really raise the sensitivity and understand really that identity in analog world was already important, but that will not change in digital world. And it's of course because of the, the speed of the exchange of information, the vulnerabilities and the, the, the risk exposure is of course different uh, and a special focus and attention on it absolutely required. Thanks a lot. Uh, Michael, could you comment a little bit on um, this world of real-time information that we're going to move towards? Because clearly the sorts of work that you're focusing on, whether it is driving a car, whether it's looking at integrated supply chains, it seems to me that most of us think about the information that we access is very much historic. But we're just about to move into an era, you see 5G, you see Internet of Things coming, um, you look at what you're sort of doing with uh, automotive technologies, where we truly are in a world of real-time information, whether you're walking into a shop, whether you're driving a car, whether you're looking at where things are in your supply chain. How does digital identity, or how critical is digital identity in that world? Well, I mean, currently, while we talk now in November 2019, we are not there that we have in all parts of the world. If you are shopping or working with autonomous solutions, like with uh, autonomous driving, we do not have everywhere the, the level of saying we have access to, to real-time data. However, we see, of course, the first cases very concretely. And, of course, it's very compelling. It's a very, uh, well, interesting offering. To, to, make, to say it a bit drastically, nobody cares too much whether the city believes in a speed limit or in a certain road condition. What counts is actually what do we see in reality. Is there an accident? Is there black eyes? Can I drive the way I would like to drive? Or you can translate it to shopping. You go into a shop and you see um, the, the, the pricing system and the offering really in real time. And in that situation, if a customer, a consumer, a driver is coming to a scenario, uh, it's of course very important because certain of the, let's say, the environment, the point of interests, may vary. It is highly individual. And then it's of course very important to know who is coming around the corner. And that may, be, may create huge benefit for that concrete uh, person in a very concrete situation. I do see, of course, that there is risk associated too if you don't manage it properly. Therefore, uh, we do not have most likely time to talk in detail about anonymization techniques of the future in the context of privacy, which we are working very actively on. But this is crucial that we put the the, the human really in the center uh, that this person can consent into in, in order to proceed with a given situation, with a given solution. Very good, thank you. Sebastian, let me come to you. So Dell's strapline is the future is better than today. So as uh, someone who has a, a company which is critical in terms of uh, the hardware, the infrastructure that we're all using, which enables us to access uh, internet. Tell us a little bit about how Dell thinks about digital identity, and what is it that we see coming on the horizon which you think is particularly important for us to note? Thank you, Mark, and thank you for the invitation to this important uh, discussion. As you've mentioned, uh, Dell Technologies uh, provides uh, infrastructure for um, you know, for the digital transformation, including uh, digital identities and uh, da the data economy, data management. Um, and uh, so for us, um, 
uh, it's crucial that um, digital identities are adopted, that they are trusted and secure, um, as w without them a lot of the solutions that we are talking about wouldn't be possible and a, lo a lot of the solutions that run on our infrastructure wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be possible. So for us, um, uh, I think we see privacy and security as, as the crucial conditions that have to be secured uh, in this infrastructure. And um, at a company level, we have committed to um, um, privacy you know, as, a, as a fundamental right of our uh, customers and users. Um, I have to say that we are not using our customer data for um, commercial gain. Uh, nevertheless, our customers rightly expect us to uh, treat their data in a responsible and transparent way, um, which is why we've always invested uh, in our um, data management and our governance systems, risk management systems, and, and we'll keep doing so. Uh, recently, as part of our uh, 2030 um, corporate responsibility um, strategy, we've committed um, to create a, a dashboard for our customers where they can easily access their um, personal information, delete, update, and also choose um, how we share it with our suppliers. Um, We've also committed to um, only work with companies in our supply chain who share our, um, uh, our standards in terms of privacy. Um, in terms of security, um, as well, it's crucial uh, to ensure that in the, in the uh, products um, by adopting um, security by design um, approaches or even security by default. Um, and, um, and um, um, sorry, um, yes. And also to secure uh, the supply chain again, the suppliers with certified uh, supply chains. Um, we're working um, with, with risk management systems that are kind of state of the art. And um, we are um, uh, also working, for instance, with the Charter of Trust. Um, that's an organization that also had an event here yesterday where um, uh, industries, uh, companies from different organizations come together and um, work on exchanging best practices um, across uh, sector, sectoral silos to uh, create this kind of baseline security requirements uh, that would be adopted worldwide, ideally. So, so one of the issues that people always keep coming back to with digital identity is the importance yeah. of collaboration. Yeah. And you mentioned there the idea of security by design, sharing standards. Yeah. How do I know, or how would I know, that Dell, within your sort of ecosystem, mm -hmm are actually able to have common standards across company boundaries. Because it seems to me that one of the big challenges mm -hmm. that we face is collaboration, not just across industry boundaries, but mm -hmm. also between public and private. And that, to me, is one of the big issues going forward. So are there any insights that you can bring around how do you get collaboration to work and how to, particularly when you're focusing on whether it's standards about cybersecurity or just standards in terms of interoperability going forward, how's that going to work in practice? Mm -hmm. So, of course, um, we are teaming up with uh, other companies, leading companies in the sector uh, to work with governments. That's also part of the, the dialogue, um, not just working within industry, but also uh, with the governments and um, advocating uh, for uh, policies uh, that, that uh, set a reasonable uh, framework uh, that provides some, um, some rail guards, let's say, uh, for everybody uh, in the industry um, to, to have some uh, standards that everybody can agree to and that are also interoperable. Uh, that's very important. Um, that we don't, um, um, uh, not every country, every jurisdiction comes up with its own uh, regional standard, but we have this kind of uh, interoperability between uh, jurisdictions. And um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's just uh, uh, on, the, on the global level. And uh, we've seen that um, another, another issue is uh, lock-in that um, needs to be prevented. So it's very important um, uh, that um, you know, identities that are now uh, needed for every kind of uh, application, that they, are, um, they don't lead to um, dependencies on specific vendors. And uh, I think with, this, uh, with these common standards, we can prevent that kind of lock-in to happen. And um, the policymakers have the responsibility to um, provide the framework for that, as you know, it, it wouldn't naturally come uh, always in, in, the, in the market. So GDPR in Europe and also the free flow of data regulation, I think two really good um, examples of recently adopted frameworks that enable that to happen. Um, also in terms of uh, identities, the uh, EIDAS regulation, um, 
helped uh, interoperability for digital identities, um, I think, among six European countries now, and it's something that's going to be rolled out across the region. I think there's other good examples in Western Africa, so I think that's uh, the right direction. Very good. So if you listen to the debate so far, we've had something about uh, user centricity and the importance of that. How do you get 38 million uh, in Kenya uh, onto a digital identity system? There's insights around how we're going to cope with real-time information. There's the importance of collaboration. And so, Dirk, let me come to you. Uh, so you um, purport to be able to revolutionize digital identity. So are we on the right track here? So if you look at some of the issues that we've already raised here, are, are we going in the right direction? Or are we sort of um, going in the wrong direction? So give us a few insights about what does revolutionizing digital identity uh, actually mean in practice? And then I want to ask you a, few, a couple of questions really about the problems, because what I don't want us to get across is that everything's rosy. There are clearly some issues. And so I want to know what the challenges are as well. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks for the introduction. So um, maybe I start. The first thing is, what, what do we mean by digital identity? So in the offline world, you think identity is uh, you take out your passport and show it to someone, and then maybe it happens. Yeah? You do go to a bank and open a bank account, or you cross a border, or whatever. But that is, of course, not digital identity. So that is offline identity. Digital identity is far more. Digital identity has sort of three aspects. One is, of course, proving that my identity data is there, that my name is Dirk, and I was born there, and I live in Germany, and my shoe size is 42. These are identity data which are maybe verified. I call it identification. That's one thing. So I need that in a digital world to prove that I live there, or I was born there, or I, I'm, I'm over 18 or something. Second, it's all about access, because in the offline world, you just enter a door, or you go there and take your key. But in the digital world, access meaning I have to approve that I'm Dirk and I'm allowed to go here in. So go into it. Sometimes you call it login. But of course, password and username is just one side. So you can also enter the digital world in far different methods. We call it multi factor authentication, yeah, somehow. So you take your biometrics, for instance, and so get into your phone. Yeah? That is access, sort of getting in. And there's no really offline sort of equivalent to it. So we have to discuss how to make access really secure. And third, it's authentic so authorization. So approve something, giving consent to something. Sometimes you call it sign a contract that I, yes, I will do sort of, I approve that. I sign that contract, but you do it in the digital world and you call it authorization. So and these three aspects, I call it digital identity core. So, and sometimes you always talk about that one and that one, but you have to come up with, it, with, with all three aspects of digital identity. That's one thing. So, going back, what's in there? So, states, maybe in, in, in Germany and Europe, they start to think, oh, I have to come up with an electronic ID. So, maybe I put a ship on a, on, a, on a cart, like in the passport after 9 11 the international sort of states decided to put a ship into the passport. There's a fingerprint in and the picture and all that. But can I really use my passport today to log in into my mobile phone or to log in into the government's website or to sign a contract? No. But so states are really focusing on proving the identity, the first, the first segment I mentioned. So that I'm Dirk, that I, I was born there, that my date of birth is there, my name is real, and all that. But they have no clue about getting a secure access for the citizen and getting a good consent or approval of the citizen. So states are focusing on identification, but forget a little bit about access and, and, and uh, uh, approval. So on the other hand, the global players are really taking care of all the three elements. So Google, for instance, Facebook, Apple, and Amazon, they come up with a really good Facebook sign-in. So with Facebook, you can go into the digital doors or through the doors. Yeah, you can log in somewhere. With, with, with Amazon, you can pay, so you approve a transaction. Yeah, or maybe with Microsoft, you can authenticate with the second factor. So they already offer really nice services, and they actually don't have really identity data. 
but they will go right into that now. So Apple recently, uh, I think one month ago, Apple posted a patent, actually two patents. One patent is to put a, a sort of a passport we use to cross border, to travel around the world, to put a passport on the iPhone, put a patent on it. So making, I know how to put a passport on the iPhone, so no one can do it as well. The second, the second patent they, they, they issued also one month ago, put an international driving license on the iPhone, sort of protect that the so driving license is on that smartphone. <coughs> Google did it also, so they came up with API on Android, saying, all right, I do it sort of the same on Android than the Apple guys do it on iOS. So they will come up in the next maybe 12 months, 24 months, with a real nice identity portfolio for all of us. And we will use that all because it's for free, it's easy, it's a one-click experience, and it's safe because from the technology, they know what to do. So, what, what, what sort of in two years, so I think that that is done, it's good. But what the problem is about, then Apple decides whether you can sort of cross a border, maybe. Apple decides if you have a valid passport, a uh, driving license when a policeman stops you. Google will decide whether you, your visa is, is, is approved. And maybe also Amazon will decide someday if, if you cannot pay something in, in the digital world anymore. So the reason is, so that is, that is all true, no, no discussion about it, and I don't want to sort of come up with really sort of bad uh, interpretation of the, of the future, but I, I'm really worried. I'm really worried, and I can't see that, uh, that the, the countries, even in Europe or the, uh, the international member states, of the, of the UN will actually got that information and got the feeling that, oh, we have to protect our citizen and come up with a sort of a worldwide, maybe, open digital ID platform with a lot of providers. I mean, not, there will not be only one. Of course, we have very good sort of solutions here and there, and they're going to, with an open, trustworthy network, sort of not intended to sell the data, not intended to actually um, sort of make big profit out of it, but to make sure that citizens on that planet have a real chance to go safely in the digital world as we do actually assure to go safely in the offline world. So, and I'm sort of, that's, that's my message, and I think we should really think about that. Well, that should have got everybody worried. Um, but tell me, how would you rate the user experience today on digital identity? And what would be the one, two, three steps that we can, uh, we can how can we improve it? Yeah, <clears throat> of course, uh, that, the, the one killer um, sort of criteria will be the usability, unfortunately. It will not be privacy, because no one is caring about privacy. If you want to buy something, you click yes, 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 every one of us. If you, if you think about security, it could, could be the criteria. No way. No one is, is actually interested in security. It's, I, I really, I, I always come up with sort of, if I go into the car, a, a new car, and then I drive, I don't check the security standards, and I don't come up with my airbag under my wing, on, under my arm, and put it in because I think, oh, that security feature I need to install here. I expect that when I go into the car, it drives, and easy. So the same should be a sort of should our sort of vision when we go into a voting system or a payment transaction system or an identification system. It all should be in privacy by default, security by design, no options, no consents. It's just in there. So the only sort of criteria will be for the adoption rate on people will be usability. And then we have to go to Apple and Google again, say, they're going to sort of go into the market with a one-click experience. We should come up with that as well. And, and Linda, how, how do you respond to uh, what you've just heard here, particularly when you look at it through um, a, an African lens? Um, OK. In, in Africa, governments are more powerful than Amazon and Google. And so I'll, I'll just maybe comment and say, on your point on who decides, we had a question in Kenya on the fact that the primary document for digital identity registration is your birth certificate if you're a baby, 
uh, and your national ID if you're an ad adult over 18. So what that means is that w when I register on Huduma number, um, it means anybody who's registering me as a government official is actually making a citizenship decision. Yet it should not be a question on citizenship, but getting everybody on the platform. So I agree with you on the question about Amazon making decisions around who goes to what country and what content. And I think we did not elect Amazon in a democratic society to issue such, uh, such sort of you know, uh, questions. And then maybe the, the second one will be on, I think digital ID is very crucial. And in my part of the world, the Global South, it's government, you can access government services without an identity. In certain cases, in certain countries, government is not as powerful to offer all these services. But most of the services we have there is actually government issued. If we talk about refugees and accessing, um, you, know, uh, you know, if they're having access to food, all these ratios, you know, they need that particular identity. So I'd say, look at it in the lens of surveillance as well. The data collection is great in real time. Um, but I'd say, uh, for instance, in Kenya, the government came with a draft law that required that if I register for the digital ID, I have to put in my GPS location, I put on my number, and I put my email. If I change any of that document, or any of those details, I have to inform government, otherwise it becomes a criminal offense. So criminalizing it, but also getting data, real-time data in the hands of governments that may be rogue, means that there will be even an increase on surveillance. So I think um, you scaring us also just means that in our side of the world, we are scared even more when there's no a check and a balance on government. And so I think these two needs to be hand in hand. Um, my, my very famous quote is on Amazon and Google. They have a lot of data on us, but they do not run an army. They don't run a government. They don't, you know, they don't have members of parliament to back them up, you know, unless maybe they lobby them. But our governments have armies and you can do all these things to us. So I'd say, um, there needs to be a check and a balance on you. We have collected this information, but if it's a government-issued ID that is mandatory, it means that we need a check and a balance. And uh, tech companies should you know, help even within the framework that can I control my data? Can I see what government has on me? Can I take it back? And one of the questions we had in our country is as a user, do I have a public access portal that I can actually take back my consent and say, by the way, I'm withdrawing consent. When that's not available on any platform, then it means it's not user-friendly, it's not human-centric. Very, very good. Sebastian? Yes, I wanted to come in on the aspect of usability. So um, I agree that um, uh, digital identity doesn't have a chance if it's not connected to an attractive service that people want to use. And um, I think if we want to overcome that issue of uh, certain companies having uh, big uh, influence on uh, or kind of creating lock-in markets for them through their own identities. Uh, I think governments have a task here to uh, come together and um, to work on this kind of open standard and to create a critical mass which should be easy to achieve when you have certain public services that can only be accessed um, or that can also be accessed through uh, the digital channel and that creates uh, significant benefits for the for the citizens. Uh, I think then um, th such identity can be adopted quite rapidly, and and when you get to that point, it will also make sense for companies to take that mechanism uh, to use that as a practical way of authentication, which maybe doesn't have to rely on passwords anymore, and which could be ideally much easier for for citizens to use. And um, I think for that, it's important to have a dialogue also with the uh, citizens and to see them also as customers, see what kind of digital services do they expect from the government, and then to see what's, what's necessary to um, provide those services. It will often be, uh, require some painful uh, adjustments in the government processes. They have to digitize everything um, from end to end, uh, break down data silos, um, and also change some, lo some laws, some restrictions on data localization, for instance, or even privacy in some cases. So um, it's a very complex uh, issue, and we're experiencing this also in Germany uh, for a long time now. Yeah. Very good panel. Thanks. Michael, do you want to send, come on? Just before we close. M maybe a very short comment, and uh, hopefully I'm not sounding too naive. And I, I heard you, Dirk, saying nobody cares about privacy. It will be yes, yes. It's only about usability. We do see globally a bit of a trend that people, societies, are more matter of uh, really understanding what they are doing in the light of certain experience collected in the context of some votes. Um, and uh, we see that in other parts of the world there's, there's more appetite and interest to take 
privacy and people more serious. And I think for the business, now I'm back on with my business classes, I think there's opportunity for a bit of differentiation. So it's not taking away the usability, I fully agree, this is key, but if on top of it you can really kind of provide the required transparency and require and, and provide trust in, in what you are offering, I see huge opportunity in that. Very good, panel. Thank you very much indeed. Now, this is your chance to uh, participate and to share your ideas. My quick reckoning is there's about 60 of us in this room, and we've got five breakouts, and we're going to do 15 minutes at uh, each breakout. So you've got a choice of two of five breakouts. And the panel are going to moderate uh, one of the breakouts. So let me just try and uh, summarize where the breakouts are. They're on the screen there for you so that you can see the titles. But breakout one, which is user agency, is on this flip chart here. Um, the breakout on um, vendor neutral identity and data approaches with uh, Sebastian is in the middle. And on the far right-hand side, as I look uh, down there, we've got uh, user cases and high consumer value with Dirk. So what user agency, neutrality, and um, consumer sort of high value cases down there. And on this side, uh, with Michael, uh, group four is going to be looking at collaboration. And then group five uh, is going to be with Solana, who's uh, joining us from Mozilla. And we're going to look there at particularly how do we get engagement across uh, our stakeholder community. So looking at citizens, consumer, and civil society. So could you break, go to the uh, flip chart that uh, most interests you. I will shout in 15 minutes, then we'll rotate. And then what we'll do is we'll summarize uh, conclusions from each of the groups uh, towards the end. Thanks very much indeed.
How does that work? <laughs> how, how would I say that? Anonymous space for identity. So is this well, kind of it's both, right? It's the best practice. Or, so and, and is that uh, applied somewhere? That requires open source or yeah. uh, the, the existing one? So these are all company examples so far. Um, is, do you see a role for governments to Yeah, could be another example for for a use case, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I probably don't want to discuss that right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
The government accepts mm -hmm. in privately issued. And in Korea, um, you said it also it confirms a bit. Have you heard of the FIDO Alliance? Um, that's they, they work on a different uh, new application. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one part, of course. Right? <laughs> so maybe we can so we can distill some best practices from these examples, kind of to generalize. Um, yeah. yeah. So this anonymize does it actually work this anonymization or um, but can you like yeah. 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 so it can be traced back under any circumstances uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For example, yeah. Okay, so they know that you are who you. They, yeah, they know you, you. You are who you think you are, but they don't know who you are. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. 
Identity mixer, how does that uh, come in? For best practices, yeah. that identity mixer is correct, yeah. um, but if you're looking for best practices, it's W3C. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Same thing. Mm -hmm. okay. there's, there's no water here. This is a what is it? A standard? Italian. Ladies, Switzerland. Ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be time to change. So if you want to stay where you are, then feel free to stay. Otherwise, um, now's the moment to uh, change and go to another, another group. And we've got 15 minutes in the second round, and then we'll come back together again. So feel free to change or stay where you are if you want to. This is, is this is not blockchain either necessarily, right? It could it can be. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for that. I think you want to move on maybe to the next session. In case it's high consumer value, and any track doesn't sound like high consumer value. Uh, this is, this is then the whole point to not have events anymore, to not be identifiable by the track. I think that's the But the best way to not be tracked is to just not be identifiable at all. In many cases, like I'm, I'm, I'm quite a, a, like my feeling is quite against a lot of the identity systems. Because in most cases, I would like to find ways in which we can protect people's privacy by not having to identify ourselves. <laughs> it's like when I go into the shoe shop, you said, like, you have shoe shop 42, you just, right? Um, you don't have to show your ID card with your shoe size, because they only need to know your shoe size. Um, when, yeah, so exactly. When you're when you're for designing systems that allow you to show only what you need to show. When you buy Onco in a shop, there's no reason to show your name and your birth date. Only thing that you need to know is whether you're just summarizing. So the, I think the great thing we should think of in a lot of these use cases yes. is not yes, how, so can, how do people currently ask for your identity and how can we make it easier. The question is, yes. what can okay. we... Uh, how can so we, yeah, we, we talked about many two systems that are ID existing right now to uh, ensure vendor neutral identity. The first one is... Uh, W3C, um, verifiable claims, it's just the first version of a standard that's been adopted, and it came from blockchain, and it's about, um, basically it uh, enables you to um, say who you are without telling the other person who you, who you are, so they just know that you, you are the person that you are. Yeah, in, in this case, I, indeed, so pseudonymous IDs, uh, yeah, so object capabilities in the online world. Like, uh, we need way more things that are not linked to a person. Yeah, so privately. Yeah. 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 The use case, yeah, use case. Yeah. So the use case probably is just rent. stay uh, as <laughs> private as possible. I would love to step a few steps back and wonder if you want to. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you want Yeah. X 
exactly. I want to just have some kind of token that proves that I pay, some kind of ticket, some kind of things. It doesn't need to have my name, it doesn't need to have my address or whatever. And in many of the cases when you think like how do people use IDs, how can it make it more convenient? Also, if you want to have privacy, data minimization, uh, everything by design, like if you want to have more rights respecting stuff, don't ask yourself, how can I identify it? How can I not identify mm -hmm. it and still get served? Sure. Uh, <laughs> now we'll go to another topic that you think about. Maybe you can, but you can see, but people like to go to the YouTube shop and the guy comes from the computer, you have to choose. You have to say hello. Face recognition, you always want red shoes. Yeah. So, yeah. so, here you go, let's just continue. I think, I don't know, if, if for the people who like that, it would be great if it's possible. Maybe it gives you a chill. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God. Um, maybe you like yeah. it. Maybe I like it. And I don't I don't know. Know. Uh, whether I put my interests and my, my like, history of my shoes I had last time. <laughs> if I am in control, the last 50 years. I can share what I want to. If it's linked to my face in a database that they have. Good point. Yeah, there are probably some kind of shoes he doesn't want to show anybody. That is definitely. Yes, yes. Something more, mm. yeah. So,
sugar yourself. Can I give an example with my terrible English? Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, from Turkey. It's called e pus. Pus, right? Dup, dup, dup. Mm. That's called e nabus. And uh, every health data is uh, you must give to the government. And when if you're in a Krankenhaus a hospital, you must give your fingerprint. A guy, uh, it's it's okay. If you flu, uh, if you have flu, or Krebs, or cancer, or you must give before uh, your fingerprint. Before anything, uh, before you the doctor see. In entrance, you, yeah, of course, in Turkey, everything is full automated. Also, if, if you have, I don't understand, if you have one chip card password, why you don't, chip card identity card, uh, why you don't, uh, why you need, uh, you are all talking about, uh, must I give my information, must I give my consent or not, if you have a chip card password, identity card for governance. Okay, password, if we could passport. begin to wrap up and, and uh, come autumn, back and take your seats, that would be great. And we'll have a little bit of a debrief. If, if so, if the moderators could come back to the front, 
You don't emit facial recognition. And if we could retake our don't... seats, thank you. Not, not only government, because these projects uh, in governments made by companies. So company and government is the same body, actually, not separate. Who is state, who is corporate? It's the same. Uh, uh, in, in this, uh, for example, I mean, uh, in a hospital, for example, I mean. Or, uh, yeah. Point system, <laughs> you might. Yeah. Okay. 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 I saw. Like bank credit. Yeah, like it's like a scoring, right? Scoring. Yeah. Cool. Is it a governmental project or and everything, everything digital Is it is it a governmental project or I can understand now why you said that the corporates are the same. Governments and the corporate. No. In some cases in some, in, in some other use cases they are because the government is using data for a certain purpose. Yes. And uh, Company. companies for selling and for it's different. In this use case, yes, they are. So the, they are trying to sell a service to the citizens. In this case, the government is not free. Is it free? It's free. Thanks very much for the engagement, everyone. That was, uh, it was excellent. Let's try and get a quick summary from our moderators on some of the key points that came out of the uh, groups. Uh, what we're looking for are some insights around um, key points in the discussion, examples that came out, ideas that we should be looking uh, going forward. And I know a number of you were taking photographs of the various flip charts. We'll make sure that if you want to take photographs of the other flip charts, that they'll stay there at the end of, the, um, uh, of this particular session. But Linda, let me start with you. You were looking at uh, user agency. How do we get meaningful consent? A uh, couple of minutes on some key points that came out of your discussion. OK. Um, first of all, my, my team, everyone on my team was very intelligent. I think we are the most intelligent in the room. Um, and so, please, uh, let's, let's exchange business cards afterwards. Uh, but two, we had various issues come up, and especially on, um, on how, do we, how, do, how do we get uh, consent, especially from governments, because there was a general feel that when we go into elections, we already give government consent to do anything they want. <laughs> so with digital ID, can you opt out of government-issued ID? Um, and so 
the suggestion was to have transactional consent so that the consent is not only at elections or when we have government come in place, but actually on every transaction that we have within the government issued ID. Um, then the issue of optionality, there's also a point on second factor authentication, especially online, on how um, that would help on consent. We, there's a general idea that there needs to be education that we could have education on what meaningful consent entails. Um, and this continuous education is, um, um, should be done hand in hand with the rest of the interventions. Um, then we also had an idea on um, um, platform cooperatives and digital identity unions where people come together and actually give consent within their union um, or within their platform. So I, th I thought that was a great idea. Rather than face the big tech companies who are issuing a digital ID on your own, that you can actually do it through a union. Um, and then there was also a, um, a, a suggestion on uh, user modification of global rules uh, so that can be modified for individuals. But on the other hand, we could also have regional modification that a company would actually issue um, global rules, but then countries can choose to opt in or out as a country on this particular um, consent issue. The various platforms, like uh, various issues and advice and um, suggestions, as I mentioned, were very intelligent, uh, but I'll stop there due to time. Super, thanks very much indeed. Uh, Solana, welcome. Um, thanks very much indeed for joining us at the top table. Um, Solana, you were looking at the whole question of uh, engagement across citizens, consumers, and civil society. So a few key points from your group. Sure. Um, as you might expect, most of the people who came to our group uh, insisted how important it was to have civil society engagement in processes that tend to be very opaque and closed. Um, a lot of the conversation was surrounding the implementation of new digital ID systems um, and how frustrating it can be to see them rolled out without having a chance to give consent, um, without understanding properly what's going on, um, and as civil society finding it very difficult to engage actually in the process. So when we were discussing, discussing best practices, um, it's about openness in terms of the process, um, it's about uh, building a culture of trust, and I think we were also discussing both in terms of um, the companies and, and what kinds of best practices they um, adhere to when it comes to um, how to do business in a part of the world where there might not be data privacy regulation, um, but also technologically, what kind of um, access does both civil society and government have to the technology that's being rolled out? Um, how can you have insight or um, considered feedback on something that you can't fully see or understand? Um, so that was, uh, we discussed cases in a number of different countries, but um, I think it was a common, a common finding for all that it's important for these processes to be open. And, and Solana, would there be uh, one or two countries that you would point to where uh, there may be some glimmers of, uh, of best practice? Uh, we talked about Estonia um, as having a, a good case. Um, and there was some mention of Japan. Uh, and we discussed aspects of both the UK and Brazil. Um, but I think there, it's... Um, when you're talking about civil society engagement, I think the, the work is never done, so to speak. Um, it's something where not just the implementation process has to be open, but there has to be a, a dialogue and a method of accountability that continues over time. Um, it's not just a, a static thing, but something that keeps evolving and moving. I, I think what becomes very interesting is that we can all learn from what's going on in different countries because no one has quite got it right. And so how can we keep on learning best practice from what we see, bits of sort of collaboration, bits of ways that uh, engagement is taking place. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for sharing uh, that. Um, let me go to Sebastian. Actually, I'd like to uh, go next to the um, neutrality question and uh, hear a little bit more about uh, what was coming up from your group. Yes, thank you. So uh, there were two main themes that I would uh, summarize from, from, from our discussion, uh, protecting users and enabling portability. Um, in order to protect users, um, uh, anonymous identification was mentioned. Um, so uh, being able to identify yourself without uh, revealing um, who you are um, as being part of a, a subset, a subgroup uh, of data um, that 
can be linked, but is not necessarily linked to blockchain, uh, decentralized um, identification. Um, another way um, to protect users is uh, to um, use um, trust, trusted gatekeepers. Um, for instance, government verification of privately issued uh, identities. Um, there are already uh, some examples uh, for that. Also to enable um, as what we called multiple direction access, which would um, protect users from um, being taken away their identity or their identity being, being stolen or just closed down by an operator and then uh, blocking them from accessing other services. Um, then uh, on portability, um, Open source um, uh, was mentioned uh, repeatedly. Um, also, the need to work on inter interoperable uh, standards. There are a variety um, of, of uh, standards out there already, um, some of them in, in their kind of early version, um, but some, some good work already existing. And then we also discussed a bit on how to get there, how to uh, get these standards uh, adopted and further uh, uh, spread. Um, one, um, proposal was to, uh, yeah, there, there was a need to engage with the intermediaries uh, that are uh, relevant here, um, including, for instance, the, the mobile operators, but also the um, large platforms that uh, are dominant, uh, dominating some of the identities at the moment, and um, creating incentives for businesses as well to, to use, make use of open identities. Very good, thank you, for, thank you for that. Michael, in terms of uh, collaboration, uh, w were there any interesting sort of insights that you picked around models for collaboration going forward or any examples that you can point to? Uh, yes, sure. First, thanks a lot. We had a few very interesting examples, maybe two, two three quick observations. The first one is uh, maybe self-evident, however, I think important to stress out. It is clearly about nobody can do it alone. So you, you, you need to have uh, the, the government clearly on board and the regulator when it comes to certain sensitive activities around identities. So that is not, not new, but it was confirmed by everybody. We heard about one case from the UK, um, which I would call a really interesting case uh, in the sector of, uh, of banking. Uh, so the traditional banking is preventing that certain uh, population is getting access to, to, to money, clearly to loans, um, and students uh, kind of there's a startup working together with the university and the public authorities um, allowing actually that the students are without the traditional banking approach getting via a platform um, money so loans and they can pay it back in the financial services is a good one uh, I think blockchain uh, technology is playing a certain role and then uh, just that you heard the name we have in the first row there Michael who already in, in, in France I think developed a digital identity he uh, kind of uh, uh, showed this example working together with Interpol and Europol and others. Uh, very interesting case. So if you have time after the, uh, after the session, uh, please maybe you raise your hand shortly. <laughs> uh, very interesting discussion uh, with him. Thanks a lot. Thank you for that. And um, Dirk, coming to you, um, you obviously had a, a very animated discussion down there about um, uh, high value use cases and particularly um, uh, as I say, how do you get that user centricity into all that we're doing? So what was your key takeout? Yeah, uh, thanks for all who contributed to that. That was a really nice discussion. Uh, also, also controversial. So no, actually we identified two examples. You know that all the Estonia example, everyone loves it, everyone likes it. Uh, I don't uh, sort of, I like it as well, but uh, so uh, no words about that. But another good example was uh, actually uh, a transportation. So when we have a ticket uh, and you have a sort of a long-term ticket, which costs maybe a few hundreds or a few thousand euros or dollars, you have to pre prevent that is sort of that, that someone else is using that. So you have to show it. And there's a good uh, um, example from Tallinn. It's called Yelby. And I think that is also uh, now uh, a roll out at, uh, roll, rolled out in, in Berlin, I've heard. But also we discussed uh, sort of future use cases which are not really sort of uh, solved yet, uh, but will be, will be sort of, will be push the identity, the digital identity maybe in the market and then will sort of, that, that everyone accepted it more. That one is uh, the, the voting. So sort of voting is one of the crucial things. Yeah? So we discussed it, how difficult it is to come up with a good e-voting system. And another one is, uh, we discussed a lot about sort of, getting back your sovereignty and to control 
and sort of uh, taking back, for instance, the consent in the e-commerce sector. The e-commerce sector is, from my opinion, sort of lost already. So everyone has at least 100 accounts somewhere in some shops, and they have your data for the next 5,000 years, yeah, at least. So you have no control about the data, and your consent you're giving. So uh, getting that back and saying, please delete that. I don't want to get your emails anymore. I don't want to get tracked. That is really hard. And if, when these use cases are coming up, that will, with a nice sort of digital identity solution from whoever, <laughs> sort of, then that would be a, give us a good push. Very good. And let me just uh, wrap up with a few sort of thoughts for uh, all of you. Um, if you think about digital identity going forward, then I'd like you to go away thinking a little bit about the hardware side and the software side. Because it seems to me that as we talk about digital identity, it's very easy to get into a discussion about uh, standards, interoperability, how can we leverage technology, role of blockchain. And that is clearly very important and we can use technology to help us with how we're going to take digital identity forward but it seems to me you can't have the hardware without the software and so we've talked quite a lot about the importance of getting the dialogue right the right people in the room the way that we have those dialogues the importance of collaboration going forward and i think the key message that i hope you'll take away from this is that this is a complex area. There are lots of contexts that needs to be understood. There isn't a one-size-fits-all model. But that if we're going to get fo go forward in a constructive way, we have to get the hardware components right with the software components. And that if we look at the end result of what it is that we bring together, ultimately the user centricity is absolutely critical. Because if the users don't buy into the digital identity systems, they won't actually use them at the end of the day. And I think Dirk gave us also one or two sort of warning signals that if we don't get that right going forward, there are some potential consequences in the longer term which we might have to deal with. And that usually ends up with a hammer trying to hit a nut. So with that, I'd like to thank the panel very much indeed for your insights. Thank you very much in to, uh, to, to all of you for contributing. Uh, we'll take these ideas away and we'll work on them and I know that I can't end this particular session without Linda saying to me there's a law tech festival going on in Nairobi at the beginning of March if you want more details talk to Linda but with that thanks very much indeed and enjoy the rest of IGF thanks a lot Thank you.